are hurt, let's give him a praise today for the for the victories that he's provided in our life.
time that we can think it's about like our spouses, but God will show us. It's really incredible that it also goes and flows into our children. And we talk about children, we talk about the future, the future of the church, which is so, just gives me goosebumps to stand here and look at all these kids. I mean, that is, that's a God thing in itself. That's amazing. How many of you are so glad that, you know, that God can take just the song that we sang, you know, what was meant for evil and turn it to good? Amen. I mean, as we look at going forward into 2023 and we look at these events and the children and things that are going on and the, um, the ministry, um, let's just be praying that God is, you know, God is just doing and moving and doing big things. And let's be praying for our children every day, every single day, because they are the future of this church. And it's just awesome to sit up here and look and see all that. And so I just thank God for that. Amen? Yeah. Men's retreat, men's breakfast, like Heidi said, next week, next Saturday morning. Um, we're just going to get together. We're going to kick it off. Um, there's some cool stuff coming up this year. And so I want to encourage and invite each and every man just to come, hang out with us for an hour, an hour and a half, and chat, and then... Away we go. So we want to get that together. Also, on the 17th, February 17th through the 19th, Men's Retreat, Trinity Pines, Cascade. The sign-up sheet is now in the back. So if you will, men will just sign up. If you're thinking about going, want to go, we'll be in touch with you. Um, once again, I want to, I, I do want to just imply, please, if you need, want to go, come see us. Come see me. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let nothing stop you. Because, I mean, we heard last week of what happens. When we get one-on-one -on -one with God, and we step out of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. and we go to seek Him, God does radical things in our lives. So, I want to encourage each man to pray about it, and you can go, please go. We'll probably leave here on that Friday. Um, we'll have a couple few rigs. We'll, we'll leave. We'll talk about the time. Probably noon to one. We'll get up there, hang out. We're going to eat on the way. Um, have, we just have a good time. So, guys, please pray about it. Love to see you there. Um, and we will continue with our worship. Ladies, just something in your ear. If you're thinking about what you should get your man for Valentine's Day, this is it right here. Send him to the men's retreat. <laughs> All right, we're going to continue the worship of our ties and offerings, and so we have ushers come up.
October 2008, a small Pentecostal church. That's where God called me to ministry. I tried so hard to chalk him out. I'm not worthy. I mess up daily.
We're going to be serving a prime rib dinner. The cost is $5 for everything. If your kids are 10 and under, they are free. So all you little kids under 10, you're in good shape. Half off. Half off. Half off. <laughs> I think they were charging me a for less than that. Anyway, you're invited to come. Uh, my wife and I are going to speak for about, oh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, about love. This year will be our 48th anniversary. And so, uh, the Lord willing and the creek don't rise. I'm going to catch Dean and them. They've been married for 60 years. So I'm going to catch them. But I may tell you something about love you forgot. Not that you don't know that you forgot. Uh, please join us that night. Uh, next week there will be a paper out in the foyer for a sign up. We need to know if you're coming, planning on coming, because primary is expensive, and for us to buy it, it's we just want to make sure we have enough, uh, and we want you to come. Bring your girlfriend, boyfriend, if you're single. Bring your husband or wife if you're married. Bring your kids. This is my business. God bless you. Uh, also, Brother Jack wants to say something. Everybody, you know, let's give Jack a round of applause with God. And Jesus. Woo! Uh, uh, Guy, that he is a walking miracle right here. So God has just did wonderful things, and he did wonderful things for Alice and his uncle Jack. So. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I do all for you. Good morning. I do this for the last few weeks, but you know, we serve an awesome God. Amen. Amen. And he's been a good to me and my wife. I just wanted to thank all of you people, you wonderful people, for all your prayers. For I went through what I went through with this heart surgery, but also I want to give a special thank to the long ladies that brought food to my house. Oh yeah, that's cool. She helped my wife and I out. You guys are so wonderful, I'm telling you. I love each and every one of you. And then also I want to give a special thanks to Pastor Mark. Bill and his wife came over to my house and blew my spring from the couch so they wouldn't freeze. You guys are just so awesome, I'm telling you. I just can't believe you, all the things that y'all have done for us and all your prayers. I just wanted to thank you. I've been wanting to do this for several weeks and I decided today after I got my last report from the doctors and I'm doing so good. And let you guys know. <laughs>
and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. Today I want to preach on the subject, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Now, with us being a Pentecostal church, I hope we all know who is the Holy Spirit. But there is the Holy Spirit, and you can ask any pastor across America, that is the biggest debate in the world, the Holy Spirit. There are so many drawn out conclusions of the Holy Spirit. You know, when if you're not from a Pentecostal church, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. And what we have heard about the Holy Spirit growing up was there's people get hit with the Holy Spirit in church at the Pentecostal church and they run around the church. They shout. I got that coming. People lay hands. They lay at the altar. They tongue talk. And they have five hour worship services. Lord have mercy. Then you get them crazy ones from down south. The real crazy ones that, that's how we got uh, the nickname Snake Dancer. Because it's one idiot. <laughs> this one man took a snake and thought he'd be like Paul. And the snake bit him and he said, God is going to heal him. Well, that was a really nice food at the funeral service. That's, and it goes on and on and on. And, and over the years, people have got a bad rap of the Holy Spirit. And I know there's some times where we sit here and it's like a line drawn in the sand. And then on this side, you have your Catholic church. You know, the Catholic church is not preaching on the Holy Spirit. Then you have your Methodist churches. Now, back in the day, the Methodist churches, they used to, they used to call them the shouting Methodists. They used to run around the church. Then you have your Seventh-day Adventists that believe in the Holy Spirit. All of them believe in the Holy Spirit. But then you have your Baptist folks. Then right strutting in that line is what they call Baptocostals. <laughs> believe me, I did not make that up. Nope, it's a real word. They believe everything we do <clears throat> by laying hands and excitement you might recognize them if I said they call Southern Baptists. Because Southern Baptists and Pentecostal, you can't tell them the difference. Then over here, you have Pentecostals. That's where you have the Assemblies of God, the Church of God in Christ. You have all them that believe and believe me. I am one. I am spirit filled through through. I speak in tongues. I believe laying on hands. If the Spirit hits me just right, I might trip going down here, but I'm going to take a left. I believe everything about the Holy Spirit. Amen. But sometimes if you didn't grow up like Christians, I didn't grow up Pentecostal. So, you know, when we first start going to a Pentecostal church, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hey, I might raise my hand. I might even shout a little bit. But what I'm not going to do is going to run around the church. And I did not sign up for five-hour services. I remember the first time I ever, I ever experienced a Pentecostal church. It was an open Bible church. And I was in high school. And a good friend of mine, he said, hey, my mom is taking everybody all my friends with six flags that catch his, you gotta go to church. And I was like, hey, I'm down with six flags, you know, music park, riding the rides, everything like that. I can handle church. Well, they had an evangelist that day. And this lady was going, laying hands on people, and they were 
was falling out of the hole. She got to me. I said, don't touch me. <laughs> Do not touch me. You're going to have to force me down. I'm not going down today. Don't touch me. We see this here in Acts 19. And it's sad to say when he asked him, have you experienced the Holy Spirit? Their answer was, we didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And to tell you the truth, we will probably find that in some churches today. I've always said this, even though I love each and one of you, I don't come here to get close to you. I come to get close to the Holy Spirit today. Yes. If the Holy Spirit is not in this church, then we're just having a country club this time. I'm not here on social status. I'm here on God's status. And so when we sit here and we sing songs, and the, but we never understand the true power of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul recognized something is going on with these disciples. They don't understand the true power of the Holy Spirit. There is something wrong with the church when they do not experience the power of the Holy Spirit. There is something wrong with the church when you come week after week after week just to see somebody, but you're not coming to get closer to the Holy Spirit. There is something wrong here. You know, when we look at this, a disciple or a Christian without the Holy Spirit, it's like carbon no gas. You look good, but you ain't going nowhere. It's like a TV with no remote. You might be on, but you can't be changed. <laughs> a Christian without the Holy Spirit is like fried chicken with no seasoning. <laughs> Nobody wants a second bite because they know you're not good for nothing. That's a minority joke. <laughs> See my wife. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. <laughs> there are four things that Paul said that he noticed here that this church was not did not have the power of the Holy Spirit, and none of these things have to do with their worship. See, there's four things and that you can tell that even though you don't speak in tongues, you can still be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. My mother was a seven and a half minutes, never spoke in tongues one day, but she was the most spirit-filled person I knew. There are four things that Paul said here. See, he went there to the town. And he went to the church. And I want you to understand this. In the province of, of Asia where he was at,
know there was a Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our counselor in confusion. One of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to help you know what God is or not doing in your life. To help you understand what God's will for your life is. There is there's going to be times when you're going to be at a crossroad and you don't know which way to go. You don't know what decision to make. You don't know if to go right or to go left. You don't know to say yes or to say no. You don't know to say I do or H-E double hop the sticks no. I got to spell that out because I know somebody needs to do it. But God does know which direction he needs you to go. It might be confusing sometimes, but that's part of the Holy Spirit's job is to clear up the confusion about what you're supposed to do with your life. God is saying at any minute, learn to call on the Holy Spirit to make a decision. Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, lead me. Holy Spirit, show me which way to go. That is the whole thing about this. And the thing about it, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, especially in Acts, you always go back to Acts 2. And then they always talk about the when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it came upon them like tongues of fire. But that was not the first sign of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. The first sign of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 was it came like a rushing wind. Why is that so important? Well, hey, the old pastor went to seminary. I'm about to tell you why that's so important. It's so important because back here, back then at that time, their main profession was what? Y'all was thinking about who was fishing. I'm going to go back to the kids too much. <laughs> It was fishing. The Holy Spirit can be your head wind. Fishermen use the wind to guide them. The Holy Spirit can be your head wind to block you from where you want to go. The Holy Spirit can close doors that you might want to go through. The Holy Spirit can make things happen that you don't need to walk through. I, have you ever, ever, ever had a good sin on your mind that you wanted to do? And you married it. And you said, I'm going to do it. Heck of high water, I'm going to do this sin. And the Holy Spirit, my wife was. The Holy Spirit intervenes. The person you call won't answer the phone. You knock on the door, they don't answer. Are you about to do a sin and your mama calls you on the phone? And said, the Lord pressed upon my heart to pray for you. I've had that happen many times. The Holy Spirit can change things if you let the Holy Spirit change them. The Holy Spirit can act like a tailwind and move you in the right direction where you need to go. The Holy Spirit can do all these things. I go back, and I know you guys probably hear me because I'm sick of hearing this. And no, Pastor Mark's not about bacon. <laughs> <laughs> when we went back home after Getting accepted into here, we thought it was getting drunk. Satan was on us. And I, we had to pray in unison. And I remember what my wife prayed that we were holding hands. She has some of the smoothest hands I ever held. <laughs> Spirit, we trusted you to close every door. Now we 
fun when we're making the right decisions. And our kids were young. It wasn't even a minute later that a good friend of mine called and said, hey, I just seen that you got a good movie. I feel like God is going to be doing this for you. The Holy Spirit will lead you into the direction you need to go. Yes, man. Paul said, this is how I know you need to be filled. Because you are not using the Holy Spirit. They had 12 members. 12 disciples ain't bad. There was another guy in the Bible that had 12 disciples. He did okay. <laughs> but when you have 12 members of a church, you're not going out of being The Holy Spirit takes the things that divides us and he throws it out the window. Paul says, Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greeks in the body of Christ. Right. How do we know that we're not having the Holy Spirit in the service because they were in the synagogue. And if anybody knows anything about Jewish culture, you cannot worship in a synagogue if you're not Jewish. So all the Greeks was left out. But that was not good enough for Paul. Paul left with the 12 original members and started preaching in another hall where Greeks and Jews were together and they all were serving God. The Holy Spirit is the power of the vision. When we look at the body of Christ, there should be a difference if we're Jews or Greeks. There should be a difference if we're male or female. There should be a difference if we're black or white. There should be a difference if we're rich or poor. We are all part of the body of Christ. Amen. The Holy Spirit, he sees the people that would not come together in the world and he makes them come together. Coming together and worshiping in one body. You want, you want to see the Holy Spirit in a church? You want to tell me that your church got the Holy Spirit in it? Don't tell me how, to, how many people don't tell me how many tongues that was taught. Don't tell me how many people was at the altar. How do you know the Holy Spirit is in the church? It's when you get a man and a woman sitting next together from two different backgrounds and they're not judging each other. That's how you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church. How do you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church? It's when you got a rich man and a poor man sitting right next to each other, holding hands in worship. That's how you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church. How do you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church? It's when you have a person that is a pastor, that's a pastor, the greatest church on the earth, has been covered with tattoos, but I can still have a wonderful, sweet lady like Miss Twyla come up and give me a hug and say, I love you, pastor. That's how you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church. How do you tell the Holy Spirit is in the church? It's where a grandma can sit next to some 
say the Holy Spirit's in the church? How do you say the Holy Spirit's in the church is when you got a shadow pastor and no one complains how loud I get? <laughs> no division. At this time, you see that Paul laid hands and what was happening in Joel chapter 2 when he says, your sons and daughters were prophesied. It was happening right there. Let me, let me tell you something, and, and I, want, I want you all to hear me, because this is part of this is deep to my heart. God don't have gender rules. What do I mean by that? I want to be clear because this world's cuckoo is called the world. <laughs> God can call a woman here to pass it. Yes, as he called a man here to pass it. God don't. Joel chapter 2, Old Testament says, your sons and daughters were prophesied. Mm -hmm. My wife is a pastor, credentialed with the sins of the God. And I will fight to the end if anybody say otherwise. They always want to point out Timothy. Well, keep on reading Timothy. Because Timothy even said the women can hold in an assembly. Guess what the assembly was? The assembly was the church. God, do not say a man can do something, but a woman can't do it. God, do not. So, if you believe that, if there's an ambition here, you believe that for all the women evangelists that say so, they all want to help them. God, the Holy Spirit, is a closure of the vision. Let me go on. My last point. The Holy Spirit is a helper of holiness. Who can agree with me that being holy is hard to do? See, I gotta be real. I gotta be real. There's times that people get on my nerves. My wife laughs. There's times that, you know, somebody says something to me and I wanna give you a map quest where to go. There's times where your pastor know a lot of language. It's not in the Bible. I know how to present it real well. <laughs> There's times I gotta ask the Holy Spirit to guide my mouth. I, I gotta tell you this funny story. About several months ago, yes, Miss Twilight. I was back here with Stephen Twyla and I was talking and I said, you know, I'm about to be 50 years old. 
So I, I'm just going to say what's on my mind. I don't care what people think. <laughs> and Miss Twyla said, Pastor, you can't do that. You are still a Christian. And so, and I think you got this, this really now before I say stuff, I think with Twyla approved. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call on the Holy Spirit, I call on Twilight. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is our helper of holiness. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for. Help me. Paul said it's the best. The things I don't want to do, I do. The things I shouldn't, the things I do, I'm supposed to do, I don't do. That's what the Holy Spirit is there for. To help guide you through the things that you shouldn't do. It's hard out here. We were once the majority, now being Christians, we're the minority. It's hard out here. Every time you turn the TV on, there's something, some rights being taken away, not just from people, but from the Christian people. It's hard being out here. And that's when we have to lean on the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me, guide me through this process. How do you know that you are dealing or engaged in the Holy Spirit by this? If you're doing better this year than you did last year, you are dealing with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to be perfect because we're never going to be perfect. There was one perfect man that walked the earth and his name was Jesus, and I'm not him. But what I can do, I can call and lean on the Holy Spirit and get filled with the Holy Spirit, and I can make sure that Monday I'm doing better than I was on Sunday. Tuesday I'm doing better than I was on Monday. The Holy Spirit is there to help us and guide us. That's the reason I said a church without the Holy Spirit is a country club. It's not Christianity. We have to change the way we are. We have to lean upon the Holy Spirit. We have to make sure that we are filled enough that we're going out evangelizing. I've said it once before, you want to evangelize, go to a bus stop. They're not going nowhere. <laughs> they got to stay. No, they have to stay. They don't got money for Uber. They have to bus stop. The Holy Spirit gets rid of division. The Holy Spirit helps us with our confusion. The Holy Spirit helps us with holiness. I'm going to make this statement, and it's so true. In this day and age, if you don't have a prayer life right now, you better find one. If you're not leaning on the Holy Spirit right now, you better call a friend and get together and lean on it. If you're not asking the Holy Spirit to guide you like a tailwind, like the fishermen did, you better make sure he is guiding you. Because right now, we are facing something that we've never seen before. It looks like Satan is winning. But we serve a 
bitch down in the hall without water. <laughs> I'm gonna call the worship team up here. What is the future of Westside? Evangelism is the future of Westside. What do you mean by that? My job is, as a pastor is to equip you guys that you guys can go up in the Well, how do you do that? Men's group, women's group, Wednesday night Bible study, youth group. Why is youth group so important? Why is making sure every youth makes it to camp so important? I can introduce you to my old superintendent from the LL district. He can show you the very spot where God called him into ministry. At youth camp. Yes, they have fun. My son will tell you, they have a blast. But there's ministry going on at youth camp. You see, half our congregation that left out these doors, the little ones up to the junior high, that is our future pastors. That is our future evangelists. That is our future missionaries. That is our future. They are a future that has a title, but they are the church of the day right here at West Side Assembly. Mm -hmm. Why I'm so passionate about evangelism. There was, when we first came to Christ, me and my wife, they can tell you, there was two people named Sean and Amber Collins. We didn't know what they were. We didn't know what TV shows to watch. We didn't know we can dress the same. We didn't know what, what to do. They sold in us for over two years. They got us where we knew the calling of God. There's a whole world out there that is hurting that's waiting for one of us here at Westside to put our arms around them and say, I love you and Jesus loves you too. I have prayed and I have prayed and I have prayed for seven months since I've been here. And I've never heard an answer from God, what is our future here? The Holy Spirit told me, you start where you start. My wife can tell you, our first job in ministry was outreach pastors. Where are we going to start here at Westside? Outreach. If we have to if I have to be the only person out there on the streets, handing out the message, I will be the only person out there on the streets. I know some people are not big fans of Trump or Treat, but we handed out Jesus Love You bracelets, and the dumps was coming back to us. We handed out candy with a message. God loves you, and the notes was coming up to us. We have to get back to the idea that this is not just a country club for saved people. Westside Assembly is a mission. New Plymouth is our mission field, and we are all missionaries. 
The Holy Spirit is a helper of our holiness. This coming up October, I'm 25 years clean. <laughs> Oh, God. 